guys, so welcome to my house where I have created a very Miss Allen space. Um, as you might have noticed, I have duct taped a poster board to my wall and I um, have my phone um, propped up with a tripod um, on my doorknob to record this video for you because I can't ever concentrate at school and so it's easier for me to do this at home. So chances are that my kids are gonna walk in the middle of this and think I'm crazy. So if that happens, just ignore it. Today I'm here to talk to you about AP language. What is AP language? What are we doing in AP language? And AP language is a course that 100% focuses on rhetoric. Everything that we talk about in the class will be rhetoric. Rhetoric is persuasive discourse, otherwise known as argument. There is nothing that we will read and nothing that we will write that is not some sort of argument while you're in AP language, because that is what the course is about. It is a course that studies how we argue and teaches you to analyze how people argue and to argue yourself. And in our society today, as polarizing as it is and as much bad information is out there, it is an essential skill for you as an informed citizen to be able to analyze people's arguments and to make effective arguments yourself. Remember, in our class, we are not going for winners or losers in arguments. We are going for academic argument. And that academic argument is going to uh, help the person you're talking to understand your side better. You're not trying to embarrass them, humiliate them, dominate them, or win. You just want them to understand and grow their own academic argument and their own academic viewpoint. So that's what we're dealing with with rhetoric. Now every time you are given a text in this class, it will be a text that is rhetoric. And whenever you're given a text, it is going to be absolutely essential for you to do a quick thought exercise before you really get started on anything else. Okay. Now a text in this class could be a picture, it could be a photograph, it could be a painting, if they're argumentative in nature, if they're arguing a point. It could be an article, it could be a speech, it could be a commercial, it could be a billboard. Anything that we look at in this class, I'm gonna call a text, even if there are no words on it, okay? They're all gonna be texts. And when you are looking at a text, the first thing you have to do in your brain is you have got to think through the rhetorical situation. Again, the rhetorical situation. You do not need to take notes on this, okay? I am just talking this through the first time. On Friday, I'm gonna review this with you again, and next week, we're gonna do a few more activities on it. Promise me when I tell you, you will not get through the first week of September without already knowing this, but it is key. Every argument you're faced with, even if I don't ask you to analyze it for this, you have to think through this before you can analyze the argument or you're going to get it wrong. Luckily, I have an easy memory device that will help you remember the rhetorical situation, and it is PIMWAC. I know that's a nonsense word, but that's the word that we use. All right, so we have the rhetorical situation, which is PIMWAC. We have our text over here, and we also have something known as the rhetorical triangle that we will be adding to in our knowledge over the past few, or over the next couple weeks. I did not invent the rhetorical triangle. I actually did invent this particular um, way to remember the rhetorical situation. It's actually also known as the Aristotelian triangle because Aristotle actually invented this idea. And his idea was that when you argue, you can think about argument in terms of three main points, which make it, of course, a triangle. So I am going to draw a triangle, an ugly one, around the text. Imagine that text is, is fits in my triangle. So whenever you're thinking about rhetoric and arguments, you're always gonna think about the rhetorical situation and the rhetorical triangle, which goes in the text. So I'm just gonna go through this in order, even though I will let you know that I don't actually think about this in this order. So the first thing on our um, little acrostic here is the P, and it stands for purpose, okay? Purpose. Purpose is the what do they hope to accomplish, okay? What do they hope to accomplish? 
and I will take a picture of this and post it um, along with today's um, along with today's lesson. So what do they hope to accomplish? So let's think about the Austin Eubanks TED Talk you last watched last week. Austin Eubanks talked about opioids, and I think the purpose he hoped to accomplish was first of all to um, raise awareness about opioid addiction and also to reach out to people who might be struggling with pain that they haven't dealt with to try to convince them to, to deal with it. So he was both educating us about the dangers of opioids as well as reaching out to us to deal with pain in our own lives so that we don't end up um, in a bad situation. So purpose, what do they hope to accomplish? Why does the rhetoric even exist? All right. The next thing that you have to know for the rhetorical situation is with the E, and it is a word you probably have not heard before, and the word is exigence. Exigence. And the exigence is what occasion led to creation? What specific thing happened that caused this person to create this text, right? So with Austin Eubanks, okay, the exigence was that TED Talk came to Colorado, right? So he participated in it. So that TED Talk Colorado was the exigence. If you watched any of the speeches on the Democratic National Convention last week, um, for instance, we'll just go with Joe Biden's speech. His exigence isn't that he's running for president. His exigence would be the Democratic National Convention. If you watch Trump's speech this week at the Republican National Convention, same thing. The specific exigence, the specific, uh, specific occasion that the speech was created is the Democratic National Convention or the Republican National Convention. So you're gonna always wanna think about what specifically led to the creation of the text. Sometimes you'll know, you won't always know, sometimes it'll be more general, but you wanna be as specific as you can on exigence. We need to know why it was created because good speakers create their speech to fit the purpose. Notice in the Austin Eubanks TED Talk, at the beginning he asked a bunch of questions about events that happened way before you were born. Right, that's because old people watch TED Talks, right? He was in a, in a room full of old people, so he was speaking to those old people. Had he been in a high school gymnasium, he would have probably spoken um, differently because the exigence would be different. Okay. All right. The next thing is the M and M stands for message and message is literally what did he say or she, they, the person who's speaking. So Austin Eubanks basically told us about his own opioid addiction, explained to us the statistics and how big pharma had contributed to opioid addiction. Right, and he challenged us to um, look at ourselves and anything we might not be dealing with. That's what he said. Don't get message confused with purpose. Message is what they say, purpose is what they're hoping to accomplish, right? So those are, those are two different things. All right, the next thing that we have is the W, and it is writer. Writer could also be speaker, okay? or artist, depending on what the text is. But just remember writer, and that should help you translate that. So writer, who is actually talking? Now the writer, the speaker, actually has a place on Aristotle's rhetorical triangle, the Aristotelian triangle, and it goes up at the top. So we are always going to have speaker as the head point of our triangle. The speaker is the person who is creating the text, so that's why they're up at, top, at the top. So you wanna know who spoke, and you always wanna ask yourself, does this person have the authority to speak on this topic? So like for instance, right now, Ms. Allen, me, I have the authority to speak on this topic because I have taken the AP Lang um, course twice myself as far as the educator course. I've, I've been certified to teach this course twice, and I've taught this course for seven years now. So I am an expert on this course. So yes, I have the authority to talk to you about rhetoric and the rhetorical situation. Now, if I stood up here and I started telling you how to do a brain surgery, or if I came in here and started teaching you on this lovely poster board I have, how to do calculus, I hope all of a sudden you would stop listening to me, right? The idea of thinking about who the speaker is and if they have the authority to speak 
is for you to be able to call out a speaker who needs to be quiet, right? That relative you have on Facebook that won't stop posting things that they know nothing about, them for instance, right? We all have that relative who thinks they're an authority in like Palestinian, um, you know, Palestinian relationships or something, you know, and you know that you can't get good information from that person, right? So writer and they go up at the top. The next part is A, and you might even have already guessed this, A stands for audience. And you know what this means, who's listening? An audience also has a place on the rhetorical triangle, an audience goes down here. And when you see this represented, you're always gonna see arrows between the two of them because there is an interplay between speaker and audience. A good speaker crafts their text to fit their audience, right? If I talk to kindergartners about drugs, it's gonna sound a lot different than if I talk to you about drugs. And that's gonna sound a lot different than if I try to talk to my mid 70s parents about drugs, right? Because the audience matters. So the speaker and the audience play off of each other. The audience changes what the speaker says and how the speaker reacts. And the speaker considers the audience when writing a text if they're doing a good job, right? That's why Austin Eubanks began with questions for older people because he knew his audience was sort of like old white people who go to TED Talks, right? So he crafted the argument for that specific audience. All right, so audience, who is listening? And that matters because it can affect the strategies a speaker uses to get their point across. And the last part of the rhetorical situation is probably the most difficult, and it is context. I'm also gonna call this subtext because you're used to the idea of subtext in reading. Context is the unspoken stuff that the people in your audience all know that informs their speech, right? So I guess the best way I can describe this is if you imagine um, a Black Lives Matter sign, okay? Imagine a Black Lives Matter sign. And now imagine that you are a person or an alien, right, who happens to speak English and you come down in your spaceship and you see a sign that says Black Lives Matter. I am assuming that your reaction would be like, right, yes, obviously, okay? because you would not realize why this is political and charged, right? The reason you know that that sign is political and charged is because you live in America and you know the context or the subtext. You know why there are arguments about that sign, right? And so sometimes, even though someone is not talking about it, we all know that it's there. Austin Eubanks talks about the Columbine shooting, but he does not spend a lot of time talking about other gun violence in our country and other gun violence in schools, but we're all thinking about it a little bit when he talks about Columbine, right? Um, there are other things in the, in the, the um, subtext. We um, you know, know information about opioids and drugs. Um, you know, I know a lot about the war on drugs, so when I'm listening to him talk, even though he doesn't talk about the 80s war on drugs, I'm still thinking about it, right? And I'm thinking about the way crack was treated so differently than opioids are being treated right now. So context is all of that stuff that isn't being said, but that is still floating around in the audience's mind, okay? And it's important because it can shape something as well. Um, when we go to go back to the Black Lives Matter sign, you know, a lot of the, the context is why Mr. Karras and I, you know, put on our sensitivity hats and mention that, because there's things that we can talk about that we know because of context are politically charged, even though maybe they shouldn't be, right? There's just things that have taken on a political nature, um, like masks, right? Masks for the coronavirus have become very political, um, which, is, which is interesting. So, so there's context that goes behind things. I think a lot of people in other countries don't understand why we've politicized, ma politicized masks so much, right, in this country, because that's not the case in every country. And in China and Japan, they wear masks almost all the time, right? So for them, that's just the thing that you do. Um, very different with the context in America. So that's, that's all of the rhetorical situation. The last point on the triangle is actually subject. And guys, subject and message are a lot the same, right? And there are also arrows between speaker and subject, because the speaker is gonna approach the subject in a way that's unique to him or her. And then the audience is gonna interact with the subject in a way that is independent, right? So. If you are in the audience and I'm talking about Black Lives Matter, you're going to respond one way or another based on your personal experiences with that. So you have the audience reacting to the subject 
and the subject being crafted for the audience. So once again, with rhetoric, you have all of this stuff at play and you've got to get pretty good at thinking this stuff through right as soon as you read a text or look at a text. Okay, so just to go through it again, on the Aristotelian or rhetorical triangle, the text is in the middle of the triangle, speaker is up at top, interplaying with audience down here on the right and subject over here on the left. And all of these work together to create a text. Over here, we have the rhetorical situation. Every text you look at, you're gonna say, what is the purpose? What do they hope to accomplish? Exigence, what occasion led to the creation of this text? Message, what did he say? What did the speaker say? What did the writer say? Okay, writer, speaker, artist, who said it? Okay, and of course, are they, oh no, what's the word? Um, are they um, credible? Right, should we trust them? Do they have the authority um, to speak? Audience, who's listening, right? And context or the subtext that's going on behind the scenes. So this is the rhetorical situation that you're gonna be working through today. I am gonna post some notes over this so that you have them right in front of you. And of course you'll have this video, but please um, take a moment to look through the next assignment where, you'll, where you will be analyzing and breaking the parts of the rhetorical situation down into a chart. We'll be doing this again on Friday, so it's gonna be really, really important that you pay attention and um, that you learn this. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to email me at laurie.allen at barrow.k12.ga.us. Happy Monday.